Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. Uh, the name of this panel is Living in Translation, Bilingualism as an Engine for Literary Creativity. Uh, my name is Nancy Roberts, and I'm happy to introduce our three speakers. This is Daddy Joda, a Palestinian American writer, poet, and physician. We have Khadam Tawa, an, uh, an Libyan American writer, poet, translator, and he's also a translator. I forgot to mention that. Uh, and um, professor at U of M in the English Literature Department. And we have Dunya Mikhail, uh, uh, an Iraqi American writer, poet, and professor of Arabic at the University of. I got plenty of Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, first, Fadi will be speaking. Let me give an, a brief introduction to each of our speakers, as well as an introduction to what they'll be speaking about. Fadi uh, Joda. Yeah, this, can you hear me now? Okay, okay. Fadi has published five collections of poems. The Earth in the Attic, A Light, Textu, which is a book long sequence of short poems whose meter is based on cell phone character counts. Footnotes in the order of disappearance and most recently tethered to stars. He has translated several collections of poetry from the Arabic and is the co-editor and co-founder of the Atel Adnan Poetry Prize. He was a winner of the Yale Series of Younger Poets competition in 2007 and has received a Penn Award, a Bonapal Times Literary Supplement Prize, the Griffin Poetry Prize, and the Guggenheim Fellowship. He is an editor at large for Milkweed Editions, and he lives with his wife and children in Houston, Texas, where he practices internal medicine. Uh, in his talk today, Fadi is going to be examining a number of questions. First of all, why and in what ways is an Arab American translator predominantly viewed as an ambassador, a cultural liaison, and a human bridge between peoples? What American translators past and present have not been identified primarily with these roles? And what are the possible explanations for this? How does this attitude apply to poets who are translators? Does this characterization apply to non-Arab American translators who work from Arabic into English? And lastly, what are we missing when we insist, albeit with good intentions, on these pigeonholes for the Arab American? Go ahead, Daddy. Thank you. Um, okay. Here we go. Good luck. <laughs> Can we agree on what translation is? I don't think so, because translation is life. The biologic imperative that turns genes into functional proteins, without which our bodily life is impossible. Translation is also the transformation of recurrence, the creation of recreation and the, the recreation of creation. It is also Bartleby and the copycat. Translation encompasses every authorial act and each sovereign one. Yet when we say translation, we often mean its most literal sense, the transfer of the basic units of language, the mirroring of coding and decoding at elemental levels between two different sets of alphabets, reduced to functionality, practicality, utility, a transaction. And what is a career in translation from Arabic into English? Despite the necessary lamentations of how little translated literature is published in English, especially from Arabic, we can say that translators from the Arabic are governed by the framework of the empire that classifies them. It is not only impossible, but ridiculous to think of Arabic and English and not think of power. Translation then becomes a field in which the Arab Anglophone is dominated, the representation regulated and controlled. Translation for me is not a field of work, labor, struggle for rights and representation. It is a domain of art. 
Translation as a domain of art is also not what we think of when we think of Arabic literature in English. The translator, especially when Arab American, is not an artist. Art is a possibility mostly assigned to the original author, maybe. Many Arab Americans may be delighted to read great works of Arabic literature that are captured and transformed in the hands of a fellow, a fellow Arab Anglophone whom they deem gifted. But the reality is that translation in general as a creative act suffers in the taxonomy of art. Yet to me, translation is a freedom, not cultural bridge, not activism, not message. The pleasure of being inside language returns me to childhood, playing camping with bed sheets in my bedroom, alone or with sibling or, or friend, founding a world in which magic happens. My brain yearns for the song of language, a soul music that sometimes the art of translation offers more readily than the fabricated drama of originality might. To me, translation is a freedom from the market of visibility, the game of iconization, the false humility of service. Translation and invisibility are, of course, the hackneyed twins in our commodified world. If there is a translator, we say, there must be an original. The original deserves visibility more than the authorized version of the skilled labor of the copyist. However, reverence for and iconization of a translator, translator can occasionally occur. When the quality of the original work and the celebrity of the original author are validated by English in it. Whenever a translator from the Arabic offers English the work of an important author and renders this offering in worthwhile English, whatever that means, American culture offers an iconizing bone, a form to fill out, a box to check. The translator, with or without intention, says, I am the important author I offer. I am the important offer I author. But if we move away from the notion of important author and focus on the substance of the translated work as a discovered or shared work in the present, we have to ask ourselves, does the author of this novel or book of poems represent certain ideations in text and context of English's superiority over Arabic? Does the translated work provide English with alibis for stereotypes of the Arab that kiss the Arab on one cheek and slaps them on the other? This kind of contribution through translation translates nationalism and ethnicization in the form of language. In fact, it's an American form of nationalism and ethnicization in the form of language. Translation from Arabic into English is about translating the proper Arab who can and should exist into English. The important offer I author is the important author I offer. For the most part, Arabs and Arabic literature can't enter English unless they contribute to some element of erasure that English practices over Arabic. This contribution helps the translator toward obtaining cultural belonging in the host language, English, the language of the place that has been relentlessly with other friends in tow, destroying Arabs and Arabic for half a century to say the least. There is a difference between translating or writing into a lingua franca and into the language of the place that dominates you, occupies you, colonizes you, and aids your colonizer, arms your destruction. Through translation, English tells us who is the more authentic Arab. The rules are not clear. For example, who is more Palestinian in English literature? The one who writes in Arabic or the one who writes in English, etc. Authenticate, the rules are not clear, but the jury is. Authentication of stereotypes and identity, control of narrative and permissibility, subjugate translation from the Arabic to the service of English. Authenticity 
becomes translatability. The translatable is no longer a matter of technical difficulty overcome, but of political and cultural hegemony reified. The untranslatable, which is not necessarily synonymous with hiddenness or ineffability, remains in the realm of the invisible. I have a passage on the untranslatable, but if we have time or in questions, maybe I'll go back to it and read it. Is it hard for us to recognize that an Arab translator from the Arabic, it says scam like it. Say NSA, you know, it's good timing. Is it hard for us to recognize that an Arab translator from the Arabic inhabits an untranslatable zone into English? Meaning that when I write, when I translate from Arabic into English, I, I inhabit a space that I know of, and maybe some readers know of or can identify, that is just untranslatable. It is, it is not, it's a private space. It's that childhood space. It's a sovereign space. But which English, when I say that, which English, right? Somebody will say, which English? An Arab translator from the Arabic is not the same as, a, I'm, I'm just shooting bullet points, is also not the same as a non-Arab translator from the Arabic. And these are, you know, arguable problematic points that are also worth raising. Which Arab? Now we've, we, you know, when we say which English, which Arab, which non-Arab, et cetera. The hope of course, is that in the end, the answer to these question brings us all in a humanist facility in a majority of translators from the Arabic who can form a small country whose range of the similar and dissimilar mirrors and echoes the acceptable pool of biodiversity that exists in English, a kumbaya kind of thing. Which English? If there are many Englishes and there are, then does one translate from the Arabic into a specific kind of English? The Queen's English or the post-colonial nation state English? Translating from the Arabic into English is an official state affair. Gender is liberated in translation. And so are countries, Palestine, Iraq, Yemen, Libya. The liberation must be liberalized in translation. There are also many Arabics, and not because its diverse people are defeated, illiterate, or because there was once a civilizational umbilical cord that got cut off and needs to be reconnected for the brain to receive proper nutrition. To translate Arabic into English is to remain close to the official state English, which to be fair is diverse enough, but maintains Arabic as a foreign policy lexicon or a medieval archive. Can an Arab American writer be an authentic American writer? And I'm not necessarily a believer in the use of the word authentic, but I know that it colonizes our minds as nationalists. Can an Arab American writer be an authentic American writer if the Arab American writer is also a translator? Or does an Arab American writer stand a better chance of becoming a bona fide American author if their relationship to Arabic is notably distant from or inferior to their relationship to English? Let's look at first at the distinction between translator and writer. Under the canopy of writing, there are those who write original work and those who write unoriginal work that is original in a language other than the one they write in. A bona fide American writer can be original in both forms of writing, much more than an Arab American writer can be. These are national politics, basically. The definition of bona fide American can't be articulated, but like art, is unquestionably recognized when encountered. Thankfully, the definition of bona fide is subject to change, inclusion, et cetera, as if a mysterious coefficient in an equation that solves for history and time. 
How can an Arab American writer, the question goes, be better than a bona fide American writer? Not in one, but two languages. Is that possible or allowed? Is that an affront that we don't dare admit? History, philology, and neuroscience, even al-Jahil, say it is not possible. The Arab Anglophone writer must exhibit certain capacities in English. Their English must be more natural than their Arabic for them to have a chance at being a bona fide American writer who is offered a serious membership in the nationalist pantheon. An Arab American writer with remarkable fluency in Arabic and English is suspect. They can't be authentic enough to be writers in Arabic since they write in English and translate from Arabic and can't be authentic American writers since their relationship to another non-European language is too strong. To have a natural or native command of Arabic is troubled waters for English. The notion of nativeness is problematized. That of the Arab Anglophone writer who can translate themselves or steer the process of self-translation in English. The problem is attenuated when the interface is made vis visible, meaning if I write in Arabic, and here we have Dunya who will you know, share her experience with us, and I translate myself into English as well, America is more comfortable with that. And it has nothing to do with the quality of the writer, but because America wants to know, as I will use the language in, in a minute here, what it cannot see. The assumption that an Arab American writer with a remarkable fluency between Arabic and English is not living and experiencing the biologic imperative of transformation in almost everything they write or create is absurd. The issue is one of trust, of transparency, of control. The artistic work that this writer does contain the untranslatable in the mask of the untraceable. American literary systems are uncomfortable with where Arabic begins and English ends or vice versa. If you can't trace it in the writing of, a, of an Arab American author, then, you, you know, then they're not really, um, they're not in self-translation and it's not something that you can uh, perform literary criticism on. Because you will say to yourself that, well, I don't know what Khal Mutawa's material comes from because it's not European enough. I know, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff is hackneyed stuff. He's repeating and all this. But unfortunately, I think it won't leave us for a long time. If such writer, if such a writer, however, can, if such writing, however, can be traced more easily into a humanist tradition in which English maintains a paranoid sense of control over its author, provided that the author furnishes English with a clarity English requires of its vanquished, then all is well that ends well. We're also told often that the force of sales determines the situation, market economies and whatnot. This analysis is a charming schizophrenia that confuses itself for a multiple personality disorder. A psychosis nonetheless where in the market conveniently and whimsically becomes a pure event, unconfounded by factors, unconflated by variables, a whole integer that just happens to be indivisible with or without cellular walls. I love mixed metaphors. Is there such a thing as a Ringlish? Uh, what do we call it earlier? Arabizi, <laughs> which rhymes with, it, it, it really, it makes you wanna say, Need there be an Air English? Is there a Sharia tongue? And what is the situation with her hair when she speaks? Or do you do the evil that men do? Let me say this. What else have Arabs done in history but translate? Though they did it superbly, sometimes with adaptation, other times with evolution. The Prophet Muhammad has been a heretic for centuries in English because he is the worst kind of translator. He translated the language of God that was already translated. Ibn Rushd, a philosopher, tried to do Aristotle, but was no Aristotle. 
And to date, no translator from the Arabic has been able to offer English what Ezra Pound offered it, or so the gatekeepers have written. whose English is invariably better than their Arabic, but they're gatekeepers of Arabic literature and English. And they will tell you, I can say, no Arabic, no translator from the Arabic has been able to offer English, but Ezra Pound has offered English in his translation. So, okay. I enjoyed the rant. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, that will be very hard to follow, Khaled, but yeah. I know that you can do it. So yeah, here no, we go. Just uh, one moment here. I need to introduce our next sorry, speaker. So the uh, next. Oh, yeah, sure. I, I can't hear yeah. myself very well. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay. So um, our next speaker, uh, Khaled Mutawar, is. Uh, uh, as I, I was mentioning earlier, he is a Libyan American poet and translator, a professor of English at U of M, and he was born in Benghazi, Libya in 1964, after which he emigrated to the United States in his teens. He is the author of five collections of poetry, most recently, Fugitive Atlas, as well as a critical study, Mahmoud Darwish, The Poet's Art and His Nation. Mopawar has also translated many volumes of contemporary Arabic poetry and co-edited three anthologies of American, Arab American literature. Mopawar is the 2010 recipient of the Academy of American Poets Fellowship. He has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a translation grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Alfred Harder Fellowship from Princeton University, the Penn American Center Poetry Translation Prize, four Pushcart Prizes, and the MacArthur Fellowship. Uh, from 2014 to 2020, he was Chancellor Emeritus of the Academy of American Poets, and he is now the William Wilharts Endowed Professor of English Language and Literature at the University of Michigan, where he directs the Arab and Muslim America Studies Program and the Michigan Quarterly Review. In 2012, Mutawar co-founded the Arete Foundation for Arts and Culture in Libya with his wife, the artist Riem Dibrid. The foundation continues to support young artists in Libya through grants, mentoring, exhibits, and publication. Uh, in his talk today, Khaled is going to, uh, his, the, the title of his talk is Mawaqif in Translation, Recurring Stations in a Mercurial, <coughs> Mercurial Art. The presentation will address various states of feeling uh, that, and, and attitudinal changes, which he has come across while translating and while encountering translation. Through the Mawaqif, uh, he attempts to define what it is like to live in translation. The word Mawaqif referring to a Nifri uh, and his Kitab al Mawaqif, which was a seminal Sufi text in which a Nifri related encounters with the divine. Thank you. It's great to be here and thank you all for coming. Um, what I ended up doing, uh, got very excited about the topic and also the, the approach, which is the Mawaqif approach, uh, is just uh, basically encounter upon encounter. In the Mawaqif, uh, as it may be typical of a Sufi text, uh, things do contradict. Uh, and uh, this sort of, what seems like a contradiction is really um, uh, to encompass the, the width of the divine. You know that God has 99 names. Uh, now go ahead and tell me all of them. Uh, excuse <laughs> me, you know, so 99, and they come from the Rahim, Rauf, to Al Jabbar, Al Mutakabbar. So God is the compassionate, the gentle, the healer but also the mighty, the punisher. And in a sense, uh, uh, to, to, to talk about the divine, if you will, is, um, is uh, to uh, cover the multiplicities within. And in some ways, uh, I wanted to think of the, perhaps the ultimate 
uh, width of translation, but it's also its many contradictions. And as Fadi, uh, I think, really eloquently stated, is the, the changing states and maybe the disparities uh, of power and perception, not only between languages and cultures, but also between uh, 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 between you know, uh, translators and those who are receiving translation. But I'll begin with a, a motif of a personal mythology or origins in translation. Uh, I, I would say, even though I'd started writing earlier, but the moment when I sort of felt like I got poetry or what, what poetry would have to happen or would, would be with, as far as, as something that a passion or preoccupation was in uh, December 88, I went to New York and from the Manhattan, I made my way to uh, Brooklyn, to uh, Atlantic Avenue, uh, famous uh, sort of a little Dearborn there. And uh, there was, the, the, I, I was living in Tennessee and there was nothing of the sort uh, there. And there I found uh, books, of, tiny books of Mahmoud Darwish next to uh, the dry goods, next to cassettes, next to so on. And uh, I went home and began to, to read these little books. I hadn't seen them since I was in you know, the Maktab al Wapaniya in Benghazi next to my father's store, uh, where I could see them. I never really quite read them. I knew who, who he was, but I was in the early 20s when this uh, New York visit happened. So I took them and I immediately began to, to read them in Arabic and translate them. I also had with me uh, 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 Federico Garcia Lorca's poet in New York also translated into English. So I was reading them and uh, reading translation of so there was a feeling like a, I was in a two or three ivy drips of, of poetic ecstasy. So this episode in uh, Brooklyn happened nine years into my life in the United States where I came at the age of 14 fully aware of who I am in a cultural sense. I was a foreigner, of course, I was living in the South. And if you were a foreigner in the South, you fully knew who you were as a foreigner, uh, not that it differs uh, elsewhere. And I knew that alterity would stay with me. I was uh, not, hadn't taken up the hyphenated American thing just yet. I felt that foreignness, when I first read Walt Whitman, his America just did not speak to me then. I needed something in English, but there was also in my language, translating Arab poets, offered me a chance to experiment with sensibilities similar to mine, using familiar images, symbols, and motifs in English. Translating Darwish, the early poems, was also a sentimental education. As a political refugee, I was uncertain about where I'd end up or where I'd wanted to go. And I was aware that I'd be gone, that I'd gone too long, that the link between my upbringing and my early adulthood had many gaps, which were the only place I could exist. American are now more aware of the difficulties faced by immigrants from my region. But back in the 1980s, Arab bashing was even more gratuitous than now. That went along with the Reagan administration's policies of global racism, which uh, we see have come uh, full force with Trump. Who would say in a country, who would stay in a country like that if one had a choice? In the old days, one would call the state of uh, alienation, political, social, or cultural. In an early romantic view of poetry, such alienation can make can take the poet a long way. Privileged with the, or disadvantaged by alienation, as the case may be, what I found interesting about Lorca's poet in New York was his delirious anger against the modernity machine. In Andalusian, he was so enraptured and frightened by New York that he turned the city into a theater where an ancient nightmarish vision of Dante's inferno met surrealism, where folk mythology from Andalusia fused with the modern, with a modern underworld creeping up the skyscrapers. In Poet in New York, Lorca confronts what Garcia Marquez called the reality that is in itself out of all proportion. In that case, realism or the lyric voice grounded in shared knowledge was not appropriate. Lorca needed an athletic imagination to protect himself from being dissolved and sent streaming down the many drains that populate the poems in that book. A sense of political grievance, anger at feeling trapped, albeit in America, along with a desire to preserve something which was about to be lost, 
were what I had brought with me to write poetry. I was writing in English and my sensibility was rooted in a vision that needed to be translated. Not surprisingly, I found great affinity in poets like Pablo Neruda, Cesar Vallejo, Constantine Cavafy, and most of all, Nazem Hekmet, who happened to be poets in exile. Uh, other poets, American poets that I was drawn to also were translators. So as far as I was concerned, every American poet I latched onto afterwards had about him or her the scent of translation. Translation was the sweat and frankincense of home, variable and the same. Um, translation is also, uh, I would say, very, uh, very personal. It's a, it's, it, it is a, what I'm calling in this piece, and I don't know if I have to command of the full language. I'm thinking of the, the translation as a mirror stage. The phrase mirror stage is from psychoanalysis. And it is the stage when a child begins to recognize uh, himself or herself as an autonomous being. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's in the early months of existence. Uh, so there's a basic experience of narcissism involved in the creative process, maybe more so among poets than fiction writers. You write a piece, you work on it, leave it for a short while and come back to it again. The piece is done, but you keep looking at, at it again. What you're looking at in the poem is yourself or an attempt to impress yourself with yourself or to see yourself mirrored in the language. But you can't keep your eyes off it for some time. This also happens with translation. You translate the poem, you review it, you check it again against the original text, read it again and again to see that it's done but also to see if the words can fill your mouth and are uttered comfortably from it. You want the new poem to become part of your voice or believed by your voice. You are filling the poem with your spirit until you find yourself in it. I call this phenomenon a mirror stage because it happens at the beginning of the act of creation. After some time, if the poem is done and the baby can fend for itself, you put it away. If it succeeded in filling your mouth and voice, it passes and it's kept, and if not, it's forgotten. The rediscovery can occur after some time. You find an old poem or translation, re-encounter it again, and the, sort, of the, 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 sort of the mirroring of yourself in the translation begins. Uh, I'll say more, but I want to also know the difference between the fact of being bilingual or multilingual and the work of translation. Being bilingual, eventually one slips into code switching with people, like a lot of us put code switching to it, with people of familiar background or experience. Being bilingual is like being a two horse carriage. When one horse slackens, the other one picks up, the carriage somehow maintains its pace. Translation is akin to two languages in a way that are competing, uh, performing next to each other. One language says this way, how does the other language say? Being bilingual or being, uh, you begin to realize where one language at first is, to, um, where uh, 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 in translation, you begin to, to sort of see how, uh, while the languages are complementing each other, one begins to fail to capture what the other is doing. The horses are in some ways on a military march and must all be on par with each other. No one is picking up the other slack. Also, you, you have to stay in that language, in the lane of your language. Translation, which is a conscious practice, brings into it one's awareness, a sense of command, and a sense of the multiplicities of one's voice. That's why I'm calling it a mirror stage to use Lacan's term. The mirror stage describes the formation of the ego via the process of identification. The ego being the result of identifying with one's own specular image or with seeing oneself or becoming aware of one's image. This awareness leads the child to make gestures and movements or uh, uh, to exercise its presence and repeats them to verify that these originate in him. The child sees itself in the world and in spatial relation with others around him in the space around him. A such translation can bring about an awareness of one's voice and with that an awareness of one's ability to make similarly deliberate gestures that announce the ego's presence to itself. Immersed in the automatic operation of one language, one can operate linguistically in a half-conscious manner. Translation, however, forces us to be aware of what we're saying and the ability to duplicate speech between one language and another. I'm not sure uh, 
what the psychological connection is between narcissism and the mirror stage. It is that the Lacan's mirror stage is a, a, a sort of an elucidation of Freud's notion of narcissism. But I'm saying that here, that translation, a moment in which a translator sees himself moving in an oral mirror or being echoed and duplicated brings on a narcissistic pleasure and affirming pleasure. Alternately, the failure to translate is a kind of painful repression. According to Freud, repression is the withholding of an idea from becoming conscious. In fact, he uses the verb translate in describing how ideas move from the unconscious mind to the conscious to consciousness. These ideas would have to be translated or allowed to be translated when they are, and when they are not, these untranslated ideas become repressed feelings. In terms of the mirror stage, I want to suggest that the untranslatable becomes like looking at one's face in a foggy mirror and not finding yourself. And I mean precisely that, that you do not find the translated poem, the text you have translated as representative of you. Yes, you have been authentic. You have tried to convey the writers and the original text words, but it is you that you are seeking in the mirror. Otherwise, why does the untranslated irk the poem that one could not translate or limbs are unmoving, becomes limbs that are unmoving, our tongue that is tied, and words that quite do not match the untranslated text. We feel repressed, not finding ourselves in the mirror. Uh, the word mokif itself is very interesting. Uh, the word mokif, uh, one of the mokif is al mokif al azim is the day of judgment. It is the great pause. Uh, in uh, pilgrimage, Al Mawqifan or Jabal Arafat, uh, the mountain of Arafat and uh, the mountain of Mazdalifa, they are the two places where you stand. Has to do with standing, has to do with pausing, it has to do with stance, it has to do with uh, 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 situation, what is the Mawqif now, and also perhaps in one of the uh, sort of weaker moments of the word mokif, uh, the Arabic uses the word mokif for parking lot as well. Uh, <laughs> but in, uh, uh, in Nifari, the mokif is the moment when you are made to stop. The first, the beginning of every section uh, is awqafani, he made me stop, or as it's been translated. So it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a matter of, of the wanting to stop. It is a forced stoppage. Um, Michael Sells uh, says, um, uh, translates it as he stood me, who is one of the greatest translators mm -hmm. to Arabic. And Pierre Jouret, but basing it on French, he stopped me. The idea, I think what the reason Michael Sells may have stood, he stood me, is he wanted to give us a sense of, of how uh, this this pause, this forced pause, is different from uh, so so so. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is that I am um, uh, taking a great Sufi book and I'm shamelessly, scandalously attempting to appropriate its title for my own sense of grandiosity. Uh, but let me move on. <laughs> Translation and authenticity. Uh, how much time do you say? You have a lot of time because I'm going to talk two minutes. Oh, <laughs> uh, the so cover for me. Okay. <laughs> no, five minutes. <laughs> uh, let me read uh, two stories, perhaps. Again, these are like, uh, um, or maybe oh, um, at home in Libya after years of living away in the enigmatic state of arrival, I spent my first day in the banal world of funeral wakes. Uh, where customary words such as azana wahad are repeated among the attendees. I came to Libya after many hours really to attend my father's funeral. Mm -hmm. And everybody said azana wahad, azana wahad. The phrase is repeated a thousand times and its meaning buried in the automatic perception of ritualized utterance where heartfelt sentiment dies. I wrote this a while back. Azana wahad means our grief is one. Our grief is one. During the noisy nonchalant gatherings of my father's funeral in Libya, only in translation in my English did the word our grief is one mean anything to me. I called that meaning from the mouth that did not maybe mean to touch me so deeply. When it was translation that allowed me to leap like an endos endoscopic lens 
into the mourner's heart to seek the solace I needed. Proof again, I can do it. I'm just copy, I can do it. <laughs> Proof again that identities are made or scooped or dug, never quite passed on or given. Maybe. And that effort into reading the words beyond the words people said, the quiet probing of what my countrymen were trying to really tell me and my need to translate them, how and was how I began to seek my return and to find my person. Meaning, uh, what I meant to say about this passage uh, earlier is that translation is, is that I needed to, I needed the words to touch me in a different way. So translation uh, had to happen. And now that I began to translate the words, in a, in a, I understood them in Arabic, but I needed to sort of signify them differently to English. Um, and I, afterwards, uh, also what, what I learned from this incident, I just, I began to really, the words of uh, ritual words, uh, uh, especially on social media, now began to grate on me, like somebody's, someone has died uh, or was in a hospital, and we wish you a speedy recovery. Uh, uh, you know, may you somebody rest in peace. I can't stand seeing these words. Mm -hmm. And I just got bothered with them. And I tried to make sure now that, uh, that I would console people in specific words that are specific to them. But now with social media also, you have many, many more friends. And many of them are <laughs> friends that you agree with about politics and poetry and so on, but you don't know their parents. You don't know who died. So in a sense, I'm reviewing this policy of authentic consolation because I don't know how to console everyone individually. But also, as I began to rethink this, in this struggle, I also thought again about my father's funeral and the repetition of Azan Wahid and how it grated on my ear, hearing it for a thousand times or so, and how translating it to English where it sounded first seemed more consoling and sustaining. But in doing so, I was being selfish and American selfishness. I had failed to tie my impressions together I arrived in Benghazi in 2000, where the country was still under a brutal dictatorship, where funerals were the only sort of public assembly allowed, and where they had they and weddings, wedding gatherings were the only time people got to meet their fellow citizens openly. Funerals, like weddings, were not uh, unlike weddings, were not by invitation. Anyone could go to a funeral wake. One could come as long as the deceased families were accepting mourners. These funeral gatherings were essentially the only form of civil society the city had. And like Friday prayers, the poor can find themselves sitting next to the rich mm -hmm. and where people can hear news about what's happening around them, learn who's who, a scholarship for your daughter, a funeral that you, at a funeral you can learn uh, who's in charge of that, a license for this or that business, a passport, land being sold. A funeral is a place where the foggy, complicated, dysfunctional state that Libya was at the time uh, and that people lived in became a little more manageable. Windows opened during funerals. There were clues. There were clues like the coupons we used at the supermarket. That's what funerals offered people in many ways. There's another spiritual aspect to this funeral visitation business. Muslims are encouraged to console the loss of everyone in the community, whether they knew the dead or not, or the bereaved family or not. Attending the funeral procession or the burial rites of consoling the bereaved is not about the consoler or the console, it is about death itself. One does these things to remember that, to meditate on it, and to be in the presence of others who are close to it. The sudden end of a life, or the long drawn out illness that nonetheless ended in death, the soul returning to its maker. Who knows what end it face, will face? You join others in mourning, not only to console, but to think about your death, which is the religious context uh, that, that makes you think about your life, when you think about your death. Where is it now, my life? How will my face, my maker, if death were to come now? In essence, what I realized years later that my father's funeral, his death or mourning, and the mourners who consoled me, all of this is not about me or my loss, but about other people's lives and how death or shared grief can enliven people's sense of their existence and can nourish a sense of responsibility and awareness about the world, the world they live in, even though they use a ritualistic language. Uh, I'll read these three uh, pieces. Motive of feeling pride in the face of accusation of betrayal and inadequacy. 
I heard this expression, which is a uh, translation is betrayal. I've heard it often uh, in the midst of uh, once a conversation stated in a nonchalant manner and was in fact flung at me in a quickie interview with an Arab media journalist. It's a cliched question that people who do not read deeply will just fling into conversation when translation is mentioned. It is a phrase that incenses me. I hear a version of this accusation against translation in my classes sometimes. Students, even graduate students sometimes, when reading a translated poem, are prone to comment about the weakness of a certain uh, poem or accuse it of being badly translated or that something is missing in translation with the assumption that the original has more, has to have more. Some then express the wish to read the poems in the original or some point in their lives uh, as that type of reading in the original would uh, not be mediated through some translator. Now we're gonna we go to the origin. You wanna read it in the original, you understand it, you appreciate it. And it's just this terrible translation is getting in the way. What Arab literati and their attendant press corps, which is made up of themselves, mean by translation as betrayal is exactly that point about something lost in the translation and that the translation being never fully adequate thus betrays the original. I cannot tell you how upset I get when I hear it. Uh, the accusation of betrayal or the casual assumption of the incompleteness of translation and the baseless, uninformed favoring of the original. Um, so, um, but how do these people know? Why do they just throw that uh, uh, sort of statement there or about the completeness, incompleteness of translation? What I feel at these accusations and falsity is an immense sense of loyalty to other translators and the necessary work that it has done for every language, that languages die if they do not mate with other languages, that all our literary arts are nourished by translation on a regular basis. And our strength in certain fields of the art still can be traced to translation, where whether it's Baudelaire, Ibsen, Tolstoy, and Rousseau, all of them, just mention them. Baudelaire, Ibsen, Tolstoy, Rousseau. Where would we have American literature? We, and and I mean, political thought. At the same, uh, and the same can be said for all modern languages, where works of translation help languages renew and leapfrog themselves into new innovations. In that sense, translators are true pioneers of any literature, a tribe I am deeply honored to belong to. Malpif, but translation is indeed betrayal. And just going off on that last point where text translated into a language helped it renew itself. Indeed, I'm now recalling Walter Benjamin's The Test of the Translator of the Present Time. I remember Benjamin's attitude in support of translation and its significance in giving life to the host language. Benjamin quotes Rudolf Penwitz, who urges German translators to abandon fidelity and reverence of their own language instead of turning Hindi, Greek, and English into normal German. He advises them to turn German into Hindi, Greek, and English. The basic error of the translator, he says, is that he preserves the state in which his own language happens to be instead of allowing his language to be powerfully affected by the foreign tongue. He must expand and deepen his language by means of the foreign language. So the foreign language is a fertilizer, if you will. Benjamin explains that their uh, explanation that the foreign language incorporated into one's language will help it develop and remain open to the future by transcending their own inherent intentions. Translation creates an engine of dialogic interaction that will motor this drive to self-transcendence, not only of the language, but of the culture as a whole. Revisiting Benjamin's essay a few years ago, I remember how at this point in the essay, it used to make me feel so optimistic and, and pause with the realization. I'm just like, really, yes, that's what ought to happen. Until then, and I had translated mostly, almost solely from Arabic to English, uh, the reason that I felt at ease is that I've devoted so much of my time working to fertilize the English language, burying Arab poets in it, uh, and had done next to nothing to strengthen my mother tongue. But then I visited many Arab countries and had much more access to the Libyan literary scene. And it was during th this three visit with Benjamin Essie that I realized that I had done so little uh, for Arabic. Was I betraying my language, my people, by not expanding and deepening their language? 
Was I helping fortify English and aiding it in transcending its own limitations? Its own limitations in what way? And how does that relate to my part of the world? Again, how is fortifying English with Arabic helping people of the Arab world? How is English consuming Arabic poetry beneficial at all? I mean, I it was a translator who came to the book. I think some of Saudi uh, poetry, some of it becoming out during the Iraq war. So, and then the poem is being sort of used in a way as an accusation of Iraq. So, uh, so how is that? Again, was I betraying my language? Uh, what am I helping English transcend? A decade ago, I began to devote much more time to translating Arabic than English. And I'll read one more. I know I've, uh, the idea of uh, uh, translation is betrayal. Um, it's, again, there are, this is, this is gonna be maybe the, the hardest point to present in this piece, but, um, but there are more positive points when this piece comes out, you will you'll find them. But for now, I think because this is in the news. Uh, the, and this is Malpif and Traditori Traditori. This is uh, also on the train. Traditori Traditori is an Italian expression uh, which maybe seems the source of the claim that translation is betrayal. It is not clear from which part of Italy this expression originates. As much as this is an intriguing concept, it is likely that the oral proximity of traduttori, traduttori, the words because they're close to each other, is what made this sort of concept stick. Uh, and let's say ideas have a sonic resonance, uh, uh, tend to carry a greater resonance. To be or not to be, it's such a, it's such a melodic, rhythmic line that. A lot of people, even those who don't think, know English will, will, will know. And that idea sticks with people. So when we're talking about sound and resonance, I mean the ability of language to penetrate us without necessarily passing through the checkpoint of me. Uh, and then there's the notion of the sacredness of one language. This is part of why traditory, traditory, they should betray. There's an immediate distrust of being taken in the intuitive rejection of people to being photographed long ago, not wanting their image to be taken in by the camera. As there is the fear people have of having their images or their children's images being made available on the internet to anyone. So if we take that, if we think of language as content, that it can be translated and put out there, making those who are being translated vulnerable I want to keep people like, yeah, if I take your children's pictures and put them on the internet, there is a sense in that material. Maybe that would not be there. It, because the language can, can make us vulnerable. So I want us to make that comparison. Words like images when transported can fall into the hands of people who do not appreciate them or hold them in the same esteem. And if power is knowledge is power, um, somewhat, in, and that politicizes the, the, the process of cognition, uh, some, when someone knows something, it gives them an advantage. And he who would lose that thing, uh, uh, who, who would lose this knowledge could feel uh, uh, less empowered. But in general, if you give away my knowledge, I lose my power. If others can use the knowledge I possess for their own purposes and these thwart mine. So I think we have to accept this concept. My sense is that this must be the meaning in the Italian concept of traditori, traditori. A secret language gives power only so long as it is secret. And I betray the secret when I translate, putting the knowledge and the power in alien hands. I, I, I have to struggle with this as a translator from the Arabic. I have to now, with, the, with my sort of optimism, I'll translate to English, Arabic literature will be uh, available, et cetera. Well, Maybe not. Uh, uh, so uh, when I translate putting knowledge, perhaps in alien hands, wrong hands. Indeed, God may have cursed humanity by splintering our tongue in many languages as in the Tower of Babel. That was, that was, that was God cursed us, made us have many languages. Okay, fine. But I also think that even if we did begin with one language, we would have created different languages in order to tell secrets, even in the Tower of Babel. 
and to exclude those whom we fear. We make new languages and codes in order not to betray each other. This last point, of course, brings us to the recent news in Afghanistan, and before that to Iraq, as the Taliban seized Kabul and as the Americans armed forces and other Western organizations were leaving Afghanistan, one began to hear a great deal about translators. In fact, the NATO rescue effort taking place in Afghanistan at the time was mainly devoted to rescuing translators and their families. America was rescuing translators. Germany rescuing translators. Italy also rescuing translators. Even Britain, which had left Afghanistan in 2012, swept in to try to save transits when they remained in Afghanistan and felt endangered. In fact, the US has been relocating transit for several, maybe decades now. And before Iraq and Afghanistan, it settled with Vietnam. The Vietnamese people on the roof of the US embassy in Saigon in 1974 or 75, four or five, many of them were probably transit. As were hundreds who ran in the wake of the US military plane uh, as it took off from the Kabul airport. Western media, even left-leaning NPR, has reported many stories about the special bonds that had been forced between American military personnel, as well as civilian officials and their translators, and how much effort the Americans had devoted to rescuing their Afghan friends. I'm not uh, here to explore and even speculate about this special bond. I am captivated and intrigued by how presumptively these translators are considered traitors, not only by the Taliban, but also by other Afghans. To what extent do these military translators uh, uh, are a case of point that translation is betrayed? I mean, a lot of these translators accompanied American officials, uh, military, as they raided Afghan houses, as they translated. And in many cases, these translations were also what the American military personnel were telling them to tell the Afghans. The Americans often were not listening or interested in listening to what the Afghans said in defense of themselves. And in a sense, these translations were kind of, that's why why transition cannot keep going in that one direction, because it leads to death. To what extent these military translators are case in point that translation is betrayed? And if these translators were not traitors, what were they? So I'll end with this half the table. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Khaled. Um, so we now move to Dunya, and um, let me introduce her. Dunya Mikhail is an Iraqi American poet and writer uh, who was born in Baghdad, Iraq, and moved to the United States in 1996. Her books include The War Works Hard, which was short-listed short -listed for Griffin, Diary of a Wave Outside the Sea, which won the Arab American Book Award, and In Her Feminine Sign, named by the New York Public Library as one of the best 10 poetry books of 2019. Her nonfiction, The Beekeeper, was a finalist for the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award and long-listed for the National Book Award. Her, de her debut novel, The Bird Tattoo, was shortlisted for the Arabic Booker Prize. Dunya has been the recipient of a United States Artist Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Knights Foundation Grant, a Kresge Fellowship, and the United Nations Human Rights Award for Freedom of Writing. Her writing has garnered attention from such outlets as the PBS NewsHour, The New Yorker, New York Times, The Guardian, and poetry, among others. She currently teaches Arabic at Oakland University in Michigan. So today, um, Dunya will be talking about the experience of self-translation, or as she refers to it, writing it again, as it applies to the writing of her poetry collection entitled In Her Feminine Sign, which was, has, been, it has been published in both English and Arabic. The Arabic uh, comes. The Arab, Arabic title is Al Gariba to be Ta'ih al Marbuta, uh, published by Dar Rafidain, and both the English and the Arabic came out in 2019. Welcome, Dunya. Thank you. 
Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the organizers. Really wonderful feeling to be here. And I already enjoyed so much the, the two talks uh, before me. And yes, uh, I agree that uh, translators need to be rescued, not only on political level, <laughs> on the artistic level. I'll tell you something like when uh, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, like you read something powerful translated, I mean, not translated, like, I mean, you don't know if it's translated or not. Um, if it is uh, powerful, uh, you like it, you say, wow, this writer is great. And then if you don't like it, you say, maybe the, I mean, when you know it's translated, you know, maybe it's not good translation. <laughs> so they are always, you know, it's not fair. And also there's a saying, um, I think it's an Arabic saying, I'm not sure, or if it's Persian saying that there is, um, they say, translating poetry is turning a Persian carpet to the other side. And the Persian carpet is distinguished by, it's really different two sides. It's like one of the most, the best carpets in the world is the, is the Persian in Iraq, like it was like having gold when you have it and it's very beautiful. But when you turn it, it just faded images, nothing there. So it's, it's not a fair saying. So, and yes, in Iraq, I, you reminded me, Khalid, that, um, that they were calling translators who were translating for the American army, they were calling them traitors inside. Uh, so it is a very, uh, you know, I agree. I mean, it's, uh, you reminded me of that. And, um, and Fadi was talking about, it's very interesting how you said it is uh, freedom. It's not um, a bridge, a cultural bridge, very interesting. So yes, uh, writing it twice is my new uh, original. So when I write a poem, writing a poem is exploring a new world. And the first feeling that usually accompanies it is doubt, right? So that's why we, we write our, rewrite our text. We have many, many drafts because we want to feel uh, more confident about it, you know. But writing it the second time in a second language makes my original text more familiar to me. And this helps me understand it more and thus bringing more confidence in it, although it's never an absolute confidence, of course. I mean, this happens because it gives me a wider space to diagnose its flows. So it's like for me, it's an additional draft when I translate myself. So like any other writer, I usually have several drafts of each piece of writing, of each poem. You know, we want to work uh, on it as a piece of art and uh, that requires finding those spots that need to be polished or erased and some images and metaphors need to be earned. So using a foreign language, English in my case, uh, uh, is one additional step, as I said, of writing the text uh, uh, is ad additional draft, uh, additional, uh, additional writing uh, the text. Uh, that is it's fruitful and interesting, at least uh, for me. Uh, it opens my eyes more widely to those other layers in the text that maybe not revealed at once in the beginning. So this type of translation functions, uh, and uh, I said that, uh, the thing is I'm repeating, sorry, that it is additional draft. So that, let's keep that in mind. So this process is different when I translate other writers. I had some translations of American poetry into Arabic. I mean, I feel more confident translating into Arabic. It's, you know, more, it's more powerful for me. It's, it's easier than translating even into English. So I did translate some contemporary American uh, poetry into Arabic. So it is unlike self-translation, when I feel free to make changes as I fit, uh, as I see fit, my translation of other writers' work is, is faithful. And that's how um, I assume that's how the other translators who previously translated my work, they were also faithful as well as, you know, they were faithful to my original text. So when I write the poem in both Arabic and English, sometimes it happens in the same page, I feel that uh, some relationship is developed between the two versions, something uh, similar to true love, where the two texts uh, develop together without imposing too much into each other. So it is, it is, is uh, really, I feel like uh, when uh, is, if it is a uh, translation is freedom for Fadi, it's my, in, in the beginning it was like, my impression was home for Khaled, 
for me, it's kind of this uh, love between two languages or some kind of democracy. Um, in the preface to my poetry collection in her feminine sign, which is my first work as a self-translated as I call it, uh, you know, my new original, writing it twice as my new original. Uh, I, I started with a note, there's a note in the beginning of, of that book. So it's just a couple paragraphs, if you don't mind, I read the note. Uh, I wrote these poems from right to left and from left to right in Arabic and in English. I didn't translate them. I only wrote them twice. Writing these poems in two languages uh, may make a new original. This process somehow liberated me from having to follow the first text, particularly when the second text came first, given the cultural connotation. To capture the poem in two lives is to mirror my exile with all of its possibilities and risks. But as home is flashed through exile, a poem is sometimes born on the tip of another tongue. It was annoying to me in the beginning when my poem pulled me right and left, but I always follow my poetry, just as people say, follow your heart. Well, to justify my choice, I would claim that allowing such a dialogue between the two texts is democratic and even hopeful that East and West may meet in that crossing line between two languages. But this is not to say that I've achieved a linguistic utopia. To produce a text in two languages is to always hold the mirror to the first text while the mirror behaves as if that text is actually her mirror. The poet is at home in both texts, yet she remains a stranger. This English edition shows readers one side of the mirror. So that's maybe give an idea about uh, that, how, how this happened, like how versus it is. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, I actually started, uh, it started with uh, my feeling was a feeling of guilt when I started trying it, trying it and uh, uh, doing it myself in English. Uh, I don't trust uh, so much my English, but started uh, that feeling of guilt led to this because uh, uh, I was working with uh, one of, uh, I was so lucky with my translators. They did a wonderful job with my previous books. But I have one of those bad habits. I think maybe most writers have it, which is uh, change, keeping making changes. I make changes a lot in my writing. So like, so, and then um, uh, actually that was, I think he would allow me to say it. Uh, Karim James uh, Abu Zaid was the translator of the Iraqi nights. And uh, so I just last minute before the, the publishing, I said, you know, this poem, I changed it. I, I, I made changes in it. So he said, okay, send it. But um, when he read it, he said, this is totally new poem. And I love the first one more. <laughs> I said, oh, so now what, uh, you think so? He said, why don't we keep them both? I said, okay. And you know what? Nobody noticed they were same poem, by the way. <laughs> so he was right. It was totally. But that's that's uh, that's the good part. But the, but but he said you can't keep doing that because you know it's uh, it's not fair for translators to keep changing things when they finish. And it's true. I agree. I mean, if it was me, I would feel like it's not fair that I finished it. Now I have to do it again. So I thought, you know, I can do it to myself, <laughs> not to others. So that's how it actually started with a feeling of guilt for me. That's how I tried to. And the English started with being here like over what uh, now 25 years or more in the country. Um, kind of, uh, I felt it is, uh, it improved enough my English to that I can try it myself. I come with a background with, um, I studied at the University of Baghdad. I studied English literature. So it was not like, in, in Iraq, we study English in fifth grade. That's why everybody hated fifth grade because they say, oh, now we're going to have English. You know how it's in the beginning, you hate foreign languages when you are, uh, you know, little. And then I didn't know this was going to be very important in the future for me. I was one of those who hated English. So, but then, and uh, even that uh, studying English literature was another full story that there's no time for it to say now, but I went to it also by chance. And so I didn't learn much in the college, but I learned so much when I worked as a translator or as a journalist, actually, for the Baghdad Observer. It was a daily newspaper. 
So we had to translate every day, every day, translate and write in English directly. So it was like I learned a lot. So it's not like I came without this. I had some background, but I still felt uh, when I came here, my English, I said, I can't be a journalist here. I love journalism, but it's like my English is not there. I'm not going to embarrass myself. So, but gradually after all these years and readings, I think I, I started kind of the languages themselves started to, you know, found themselves in the, page, in the same page together. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. So uh, we can open it up for questions. Uh, anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question? Is there, is there a... Uh, yeah. This is coming. Yeah. And then you can use these. You can share this. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much uh, for this talk and for all the directions that you took us. I was really grateful for it. Um, thank you. Um, my question is kind of about something that came up, I think, in various of your, your discussions, which is really about sort of the stakes of authenticity in relation to translatability and untranslatability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some the thought that I'm sort of chewing on right now a little bit is, you know, how do we think about the authenticity of original works as Fadi brought up as well, the authenticity or, you know, a sanctioned or legitimate translation, you know, how do we think about that? And also, you know, authentic national and ethnic identities who, you know, I think Fadi, you said something about the rules are not clear, but the jury is. And I really appreciated that, that the way that sort of elephant is in the room that way. Mm -hmm. um, so my question really is, you know, can translators or a translated work change how we think about authenticity or how we engage the mirage of authenticity. Um, and you know, Dunya, your, your talk really made me think about how um, maybe in that act of self-translation, there's something that is troubling the idea of, of authenticity of an original in, in one language or the other. But I guess I was just wondering as translators, what, what can we do to sort of disrupt the, the sort of easy claiming of authenticity in one way or another in our works or how, how we talk about our works or otherwise? They're, they're throwing me under the bus first. <laughs> so, I, um, so um, I, 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 you know, think I'll make my disclaimer by saying I'll probably disappoint you, but I, I, I tend to think that uh, the, the, I guess the answer is in your question, which is, is there such a thing as authenticity? And if, if there is, then is it a product of the language, sort of like Benjamin says, language and language as such, or is it in language as such? Is it in a, in a historical, uh, political construction, which is to say that what is, un, what is the untranslatable? And I would argue that the untranslatable is a function of history and time, uh, the willingness of a, of a receptability. It's a, uh, a politics of reception. For example, uh, that passage, I, I won't take more time, but uh, that I said I would read about untranslatability if needed. Um, uh, it does not matter, it does not matter, this is trying to quote myself, about authenticity, whether Korea would be reunified ever. What matters is that the American cultural moment has reached a destination where it is willing to listen to a Korean artist produce wonderful literature. It does not matter if Iraq will ever speak rudely uh, to, to the American. What matters is when will America be okay with an Iraqi speaking rudely to the American? Sort of like what we're having with a Vietnamese American moment in American literature right now. It's not that these thoughts did not exist in Vietnamese communities for 50 years. But it's sort of like a, so the authenticity is really a function of, a, you know, for me, of oppressive power. Um, you know, I, I tend to think of Arabic, you know, and uh, Arabic is not, has its, like any other language, has its own problems of, of, you know, which is more authentic, which is not. And, and, you know, we tend to turn them into beautiful things like we do in English. 
Uh, um, uh, so, so this is this is not just about English itself, but it, it is it is about English in the sense that this is what we're talking about here, and we are an empire, and we we always skirt around the idea uh, and the language because that is also not welcome language. Um, I, I, uh, uh, let, let's think of even the the, the Black American experience. So. It was English that was always spoken. It was a different kind of English, and it's still the you know English that is spoken, and it's it 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 offers English so many different registers. It has always offered, but America was not ready to receive or accept those different registers. In speech, they were they you know it's funny because I think I think we we were willing to receive it first in music before we were able to receive it in alphabet, for example. There is no question of authenticity of the people who spoke that kind of language, which is to say Black American English in its various registers throughout its various times. You know, there, that's not a question of that authenticity. The authenticity was imposed from the outside on a moment in time where it can be approved, made official, et cetera. I, I, I just rambling, sorry. No, not at all, thank you. Thank you. I'll, uh... Yeah, I thought it would mm. So, he's, he's no. okay. <laughs> no, for me, untranslatability, I don't believe in it from technical point of view, but I do believe in it from creative point of view. What does that mean? It means that we can always find solutions technically for any, like we find alternative, but but it, ha it happens, the untranslatability, when we write, especially poetry, when I write sometimes, and poetry itself is a translation of a thought, of a feeling, right? So sometimes there are some feelings or thoughts that, that are untranslatable. That means they are not hard to ex be expressed. And that happens when you have strong feeling, when it's like really powerful. So that happens uh, this way. But uh, technically we can find solutions, I believe, always. Uh, I think maybe just in thought, the, the translator, um, is maybe the one not, not given the, the 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 title or the credit of authenticity, uh, and um, but also there is the authenticity in the sense of what we sort of it, it was foreign, but we authentic. See, authenticity also means authentication, if you will. So here's a foreign text; it has become authenticated into our language. Uh, so that's perhaps part of authenticity. Uh, and and that uh, credit may be given to languages, uh, some languages other than uh, other than others, uh, meaning that something from French to English, uh, it becomes kind of authenticated. French is already an authentic uh, accepted language. You bring it here, so. uh, but Arabic, as uh, not Mahmoud, I wish Edward Said was long. Long ago was told Arabic is a controversial language. Uh, what is authenticating an Arabic text uh, in that sense is it, it has to be about what is it saying that may be great at at um, at is at is. Uh, I mean, again, in terms of novels, and you, you probably know much more than I do. Uh, what is being said in in certain novels? Uh, that greats that is um, uh, that may be not acceptable, maybe does not fit um, into um, into a certain expectation. I think in all of these things is that um, uh, is the ripples uh, that one can sort of take. I think the, the problem in terms of you, you, you is that. Um, uh, is that it's you you can do a capture of the translation all the sort of nuances uh but authenticity does not guarantee resonance meaning you can be authentic you can do all of that work but it, you are just uh, something in a library ultimately in a sort of a, you are a brick in the great not palace of of culture uh, and you stay there uh, it's not that uh, authenticity will necessarily 
grant you being heard. And I think that that's the, in some ways, or not being called upon at certain moments to, uh, to be sort of being sampled in a certain way in, a, in an argument that you are not in control of. And I think that that's what maybe frustrates a literary translator from Arabic is that uh, is a kind of, in a, in a big sense, it's a kind of misquotation that you, Arabic literature is in many ways regularly misquoted, misquoted in service of the same uh, cultural biases. You can translate as cleanly as you, you want, but then, oh, let's bring this knowledge, this, this novel or this example or this other uh, point to make, to fortify the same arguments that we've heard about the people of the region. Uh, so in a sense, be as authentic as you want, you're not necessarily in control of the discourse about your people and their culture. That's it. No, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you all so much. This was wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you about the label of Arab American, especially Arab American writer and or translator. Do you feel that it's a label that you've chosen for yourself or that was chosen for you? And kind of on the point of authenticity, I'm wondering about indigeneity, right? Who gets to claim an indigenous language or an indigenous labels? Who gets to become an American writer? Um, but also the hyphen and, and the in-between and how that in itself is, is resistance and genre making. Uh, I tend to think that the answers to your questions are American made. They're not individual made. And even if they are individual made, they're quite irrelevant, frankly. You know, it's just posturing for me to say, well, I'm, you know, when I was 12 and when I was 15, but there's a, such an overwhelming sea of, of uh, you know, of how culture dominates every new group. Um, and, uh, you know, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States uh, just is all about, you know, how, how immigrants, you know, the history of, like it shows what happens to you as an immigrant community. And there's a, there's a sense, you know, sometimes, you know, the easy, like the most amazing thing, the most educational thing for me is what neighbors say to me. They don't necessarily, you know, they're not, they're, they're not, you know, I, I would fancy myself as more intellectual than they are. So let's just say that, let's blame, let's put it on me. But, you know, they want to offer me a line of sympathy and they say, um, don't worry about it. it you know, it, it, it will pass the, the, the Muslim moment or the Arab moment or whatever. And the reason they're saying that is because they belong to a community that has gone through its own strife with different details that in their eyes has already passed. So they've become a bona fide American. America no longer threatens them in the same way that it does threaten an Arab or a Muslim. Right. And so these, these are things that I, it, it's not, it's not important who that community is or whatnot, or there are still some communities who are, you know, um, brutalized by uh, a mainstream American culture, et cetera. It, the point is, is that these things are American made. These are conversations in America. And it's sort of like, you know, do you, you know, do you, you, do you ask a, 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 a Vietnamese person or a black American and say, well, do you, do you say I'm a, African American or Black American or Vietnamese American or, you know, they'll tell you, well, you know, whether I say it or not, I look a certain way, you know, and then we get into other issues that are also American conversations, you know, race is, is a, you know, is an American product and also an American, you know, as Barbara Field says, it's race craft, you know, it's, it's a product, it's an export at this point. So I'm not so sure of, of the but going to funner things, I'd like to go back and, and say that I used to believe in, in the uh, sort of the uh, sort of the uh, omnipresence or the, the, that everything is translatable. Just recently, I don't know, maybe because I turned 50 last year, changed my mind. I, I think that the untranslatable is necessary and it's not on the technical level. And I keep thinking of examples, and I think of um, 
uh, I was thinking of this line uh, from a, a Darwish line. Sabah um, al-Khayri uh, Majid Qumikra Surat al-Aid. And uh, so uh, Majid is a guy's name. He's a, a was a political intellectual who was assassinated. I forget whether it was Israelis who assassinated him or not, but you know, throw the dice. Uh, <laughs> and um, and he was a friend of Darwish in the 80s, and he wrote a beautiful elegy for him, and it had this refrain that says, "Good morning, Majid. Get up, you know, rise, and recite the surah." from the Quran, the surah of the returnee, right? In Arabic, uh, Majid and Aed, the guy's name and, and they rhyme. And it's such a short, quick line. It just like, like any language is capable of doing, you know, it hits you so deep. It's almost like an eternal couplet, but it is untranslatable. And it is not untranslatable because of rhyme. Um, I thought, well, you know, okay, fine. Majid died, you know, God bless him. But, you know, I'm in English. I'm going to say, wake up, you know, uh, good morning, Ali. Because it's, you know, an Arabic name or a Muslim name or whatever. You know, wake up and or recite the surah of the returnee. If that's the point or something like that, you know. Or I thought recently to even change it into a biblical thing and say, uh, wake up and or rise and r recite the book of return, you know, book of Exodus, book of Genesis, and et cetera. But one of the things that occurred to me was that in Arabic, because of the lived experience of the Arabic language, um, one crosses over into, in this example, um, into uh, a spirituality that English doesn't accept that Arabic has. And you have to, you turn something like that, so simple for any Arabic speaker, Muslim or not, into an, an, into an essay in order to explain it to an English audience. Well, you know <laughs> what? I don't know, man. It's not worth it. <laughs> that, here's what, the other example is um, Amal Dunkul, an Egyptian poet who died young, brilliant uh, poet, uh, has a famous po a poem called Salah, prayer. And it begins, Abana ladhi fil mabahf. Right? And, inna liyamina lafi usr wa inna liyasara lafi khusr, and so forth. And, and he, and he, it's basically the, the first line, which people kind of jokingly say, uh, O father who art in the bureau, bureau of investigation. O father who are in the homeland security. O father who art. So he changes, a, he's a Muslim. Uh, he changes a, a Christian, you know, a prayer, uses it in Arabic, and the rest of the poem is a mixture of uh, uh, spiritual language in Arabic, obviously, both Christian and Muslim. And it is, it is, you know, you can get the Christian parts into English. There's a pro, but there is something else that happens in the poem, and it has, it's a, it's a particularity to Arabic. And it, is, it has nothing to do with, like, it's not a moment of superiority or anything, but it is a particularity that, that is untranslatable in English. And I'm going to spend all this time trying to explain to people this or trying to say, oh, but we have our own ecumenism and coexistence and whatnot, and it's historical and this and that. Whatever, man. Uh, we are really about can I just say one thing about the, the hyphenation? Shasla uh, Milo uh, Miosh, who lived in America for 50 years, uh, wrote poems in English, won the Nobel Prize. He was never called the Polish American poet. Never. Uh, Joseph Brodsky also won the Nobel. I don't know if that's, they're not called that because they got won the Nobel. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, you got lots of work to do, Fanny. Uh, do not be called Palestinian. Or, but so, so in a sense, the designation, the hyphenation is not necessarily, uh, is not really a sort of inclusion. It is a compulsion on, on you sometimes. And sometimes I've seen it when I, I tried to be only called Libyan American when I became a citizen. I've seen people who are still students here in America that, that are called Palestinian American or Iraqi American. So in a sense, it, that designation is not necessarily 
a welcoming space. It is a kind of way you got to get on the, with the program. So that's that. That's the problematic aspect of it. And uh, as a poet who may want to have it, be called an Anglophone poet rather than necessarily Libyan American poet, I would say that I'm having difficulty with having that hyphen uh, attached to my identity. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you.